Thank you all for joining and bearing with us with um, the technical setup. It's always a little bit of a challenge. Um, we're here at VAC Zatre for the exhibition and public program non-extractive architecture. Um, and we're really pleased to have Anton Martins with us today. Uh, Anton Martin is um, a member of BC Materials. He joined in 2019 as business developer and has formerly worked as a contributor to Vice Magazine Benelux and editor for DGRID's policy advisor, environment, nature, and climate change for the Flemish government and policy advisor, city development for the Brussels government. He is amongst others responsible for the financial crowdfunding, presentations and communication, business development and R&D applications uh, at BC Materials. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really pleased to have you here, um, Venice, with us as part of this project. So I hand it over to you. Thank you uh, for the invitation, uh, Space Caviar. I uh, have to say that I'm very impressed with uh, all that I've seen already from the non-extractive architecture team. Um, I would like to contribute uh, with uh, our modest knowledge and our modest presentation. The title is not that modest. Uh, the future of building, it sounds very uh, pompous almost, but we can be sure that the future of building will be very different in 10 years than it's right now, because there is a storm coming up and the storm is called uh, climate change. We know that building is proportionately responsible for 30 up to 40 percent of co2 emissions also one third of air pollution and 30 percent of global waste the air pollution is actually a, one of the biggest killers in the world right now it's it's also worse with people who have uh, uh, lived in, in uh, regions with worse air quality have covid faster have worse covid and have a higher mortality so it's also something that we should take into account there's also 30 percent of global waste in building but those factors as as joseph has has also mentioned those are externalities that a lot of people don't actually see because it's a construction and we keep the waste a bit out of our scope out of our perspective and it's not like uh, it's a real real problem within the construction field it's mostly the construction finds places where they can drop or down cycle the, the materials and for me, I think climate change is really the straw that is breaking the camel's back, or in this case, the planet's uh, back. And we know now for a while that uh, embodied emissions are huge and rising within the building concept in the sense that we can make today a perfectly energy efficient building with a heating pump, for example, that is a very highly efficient way of, of, of heating a space. But we also see that the embodied emissions in an A category energy house, which is a good thing, that the embodied emissions there are also rising. So the more that we have to uh, invest in a house to make it really energy efficient, the more embodied emissions that we're creating, which is, makes sense because we have to add more isolation materials, add more technology, uh, and sometimes in some senses, also materials that are very CO2 intensive. And if you look at the global scale, you can actually say that the operational emissions and CO2 have gone down in construction, but that the embodied emissions have actually risen with 1.5%. So from an operational point of view, construction is doing well. From an embodied point of view, we're doing really bad because we should have been on a, on a downhill slope already a long time, but we're going up. And I guess this is where it leads us. The new IPCC report, we've seen massive floodings in Belgium this year. Lots of people, hundreds of people have lost their entire household in, in a few days, but it's already the case in, in Asia. There are very, very heavy fires in, uh, in Canada, in the States, in other countries. But what is maybe the most existential danger of climate change is the fact that the sea levels is rising. It has already risen so far from the, from the beginning of the 20th century up until now 20 centimeters. And 20 centimeters, you could say, it's not that much. I mean, we grow and it's, it's okay. But if you see the level in rising, the cumulative speed it's taking on, the fact that it has doubled in 12 years, that's a real danger because we, we know 
if this is cumulative and it will become bigger in 12 years, then we'll have a real problem. Because this is what happens for uh, territories like the Low Countries. This is only an estimation for one meter sea, sea level rise. And you could see the Netherlands, half of it is just gone. It's only one meter and we're all already at 20 centimeter. So Amsterdam, Rotterdam are lost. I grew up at this place at the coast in Belgium. It's gone, the, the Belgian coast is gone. And it's just something that would be incredibly difficult to stop because a flood, you can build dikes, you can build better ways to, ex to, to evacuate the weather, but you cannot fight the sea. The sea, if the sea level rises with a meter, it's not that you can build extra dikes here and there. It's a very massive uh, movement. And in that sense, we're at a kind of existential danger. It's not anymore about ecological. Is it going to be bad for the environment? It's really about us within the planet and losing entire territories, losing entire spaces. Because what we see now here, it's, it's a, a danger, potential danger in the future. But the islands and, and a lot of islands in, in, in the world have already faced this kind of, of danger. And this is what we see in Belgium and in the Netherlands. This is France. But you could also say this is what happens to Venice. If we can't stop climate change, it will be very difficult to, 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 to save Venice and a lot of other cities around it. It will be aqua alta all the time. So that's the really urgent, I think, almost existential danger that we're facing, uh, aside from the, from the heat waves, the flooding, the crop loss, and, and a lot of other stuff. So construction as, as being 30 to 40% responsible for emission has the biggest uh, uh, responsibility head. A part of the solution for us at BC lies in the waste, because we know that a big mass of the waste that is produced is actually excavated earth and we transform excavated earth into building materials. These are about 20,000 compressed earth blocks that were produced for a project that was presented here at the Venice Biennale um, in 2018, I think. Um, and so this is the, the, the actually a bio class within a Hortus Conclusus within a structure and it was a class that was specifically asked for by the commune of Edegem to let children teach about environment, about nature. And we wanted to make the building also as clean and as healthy as possible. And in that sense, I think it's really important that it's not only uh, very low in CO2 uh, to make and to produce, because we produce the compressed air blocks with volunteers, with workshoppers, and with people from Edegem which is very nice. It's circular. So in the future, we might reuse all the elements that it's in it. But it's also very good because the, the air pollution that you create with these kind of blocks is practically zero because you don't burn anything. You don't have to worry about uh, any kind of NOx particles or anything else. And you have the better acoustics. And it's actually something that we learned uh, quite, a time, quite some time ago. In, uh, in Burundi, in a little place called Muyinga. It was one of the first projects of BC. It's really, um, I mean, you have to imagine uh, a business club and uh, the province uh, of West Flanders who wanted to build uh, a, a library for the blind in Muyinga, a very, very small place in Burundi. And so with a very tight budget of 20,000 euros, the founders of BC went there and at the spot, they noticed that everything that they learned in architecture school was practically useless because uh, cement was very expensive to import. There were no big bricks. You could chop off all the trees and start baking bricks, but obviously that would be very bad for biodiversity and the farmers who were in the uh, in environment for irrigation too. So they learned from a contractor, a local contractor, how to make compressed earth blocks. And he explained them how you can start uh, compressing, how you can make the blocks uh, on your own. And actually everything that we, that we uh, used or produced for the building was made with uh, biomass or geomass without burning it materials. So it was a very influential moment and it was really a revelation that you could build with, with raw earth because 
in Europe, it's it's actually a bit frowned upon. It's like, well, or is that a traditional, or is that not something that they do in poor countries? But we saw immediately that there was so much potential uh, in applying it. And in that sense, BC Architects was was created in 2012 after uh, after Burundi. BC Studies is still active as a kind of non-profit and research. It's a very hybrid practice. But at some point in time, we also said like apart from using earth in architectural projects which is very nice and very interesting and very good for the for the climate and for the client uh, we also want to push nudge the construction market even more and we decided to found bc materials that as a startup uses excavated earth to transform it into building materials and it was a bit of an obvious choice because everywhere you looked at construction sites you could see the masses it was just when you started to calculate it, 2 million tons in Brussels it's excavated every year, 37 million tons in Belgium. They say in Belgium that Belgians have a brick in their stomach when they're born. And it's true that there's a lot of construction going on all the time. And even for bigger countries like Germany, it's 130 million tons. If somebody has the numbers for Italy, they can, they can pass it on. But it's, it's just a fact that most of that material is never used it's mostly it's used as a kind of foundation for roads and that's the maximum that it's used usually it's 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 dumped in, in mines and quarries as a kind of waste but we saw it as a as a useful tool as an ingredient to make building materials and we were a bit lucky too because in brussels we have uh, two geological layers with sand and clay sand is called brusselien uh, clay is the Iprian clay and the mix it, those are two important elements to mix and to make the materials that we make so we're a bit lucky that we have it but it's good also that you literally are standing on the materials that you can use to, to construct and obviously that it's local but we know that most of Belgium actually has these two layers so we know that it can be used in, in other spots too but we were lucky or Maybe it was a bit uh, uh, fortune that that uh, we as people from Brussels could really dig into this kind of work to to make it work. And so we have two ways of working. Actually, here you have the extraction. So maybe we're not completely non-extractive architecture, but usually at a construction site, uh, what happens is that a kind of foundation is laid, or in some cases a parking, or in some cases uh, uh, there has to be some excavation. Usually the earth is transported and, and uh, put at the top, a kind of place where uh, we're temporarily stuck for, for earth and then transported to some kind of mine or quarry. And we can already intervene at the construction site itself and start to mix earth uh, at that spot and already prepared, even insert it into the construction that is going to happen at the site. Or what we are doing it right now at our production site at, uh, in, in the Brussels Harbor is that we actually intervene, we cut into the transport. So the, the contractors now already know us. Normally they have to drive a long way up until Flanders, somewhere, sometimes even up to Germany because a lot of Flemish contractors don't know what to do with the earth anymore. They cannot, they don't know where, where to put it anymore. And so we are a kind of useful for them because they can get rid of the earth and for us it's a super nice material to work with so that's what we do at our site we make the blocks and we have different uh, kind of products it's like a briquette is a sort of compressed ore block that could be used you can imagine like a brick for uh, walls for example it's a ground floor plus two floors that it can carry so it's load bearing and you have the brusselaire which is a clay plaster a clay plaster to finish the walls you can use it on on on, on a briquette obviously and another compressed air block or classic bricks or even a concrete block if you want and then the castar which is the, the most special thing you can also see it i think right there that's ram dirt ram dirt is a very special mix you can look at it a bit as a kind of ecological concrete i think the screen is a bit lost but Oops. You might be back. Um, so Castellar is actually very special in the sense that uh, ram dirt is a mix of uh, sand, clay, and 
uh, small pieces of gravel. You want me to pause a bit because otherwise. Uh, no, the, there is happening, but it's okay. um, So, castar is, is a kind of ecological concrete, but you can use it in a very varied way. That's what we think is very interesting about, uh, about the ram dirt. You can use it as a floor, as a wall, as you can see it right there too, and even as a design piece. So, it's really something that is blendable. But in, in contrast to concrete, uh, you have to, instead of uh, concrete actually chemically binds. At some point, it becomes hard on its own. It dries out. Uh, with around dirt, you really have to. Have, it's, it's it's not more technical than that. You have to just like with concrete, you can spray uh, it all over the floor and then start ramming it to to get the kind of finish that you want. Maybe it's with a little loose connection. If you want to, I can turn the computer a bit, a bit small. Is it shown there? Yes, uh, this one is working. Oh. So these are the three materials that we make, and we actually put some of the percentages there because we would like to replace as much of the traditional materials that are much more polluting with uh, earth-based materials that are much cleaner, much more circular. So the, here, for example, you have the Brusselaire Gouet. This is like a, a castar a tabouret, just fully made with rammed earth. It's also a rammed earth floor. People could say it looks a bit like, uh, like concrete, Actually, in look, it's not that different. It's just the way that it's made. I could toss that piece on the floor and really start pushing it again, breaking it, and then take everything together again and put it in a, in a mold again and just start ramming it again, and it could work again. So that's completely impossible with, with concrete. You would have to use a lot of energy to actually like find all the elements within it and maybe then I, I'm not I'm still not sure that it would actually work. So we have the red too. This is a project of BC architects. There were the people who wanted their complete space in, in red clay plaster. It's very original, very warm color too. You have uh, U Square is really some a project that we're super proud of because um, there used to be ancient barracks at uh, of the of the police in next to the university neighborhood of Brussels, uh, ULB and VEB. But they were very derelict. It was a very bad building, very bad structure. And so the universities wanted to rebuy the site and transform it into classrooms and, and to uh, uh, create a bit of student housing for international students too, because they could see more and more that people have difficulty finding a good spot as a student. And so we won the competition to renovate it, to transform it. It's a very circular project in the sense that the materials that are used, the new materials that are used are the excavated earth, plaster, hempcrete. And here you can see a kind of acoustic plaster that we made with earth, cork, and hemp. And it has a very good texture. I think it looks nice, but I'm not objective, obviously. And it has a very good acoustic quality too. It's not as good as an acoustic panel obviously, because an acoustic panel is really made for, for the acoustics, but it has a very close to figure. And obviously you have the finish and the acoustics at the same time. And for the other buildings that were too derelict and that had to be demolished, we actually plan to reuse all the bricks that are still in there to uh, recreate the new housing. And it's, it's really uh, a very nice spot in Brussels where there used to be not such a, a great atmosphere because there was a big castra next to it too. And now it's really becoming a flourishing uh, urban site. So this is really why um, I like the whole project of, of non-extractive architecture, but I also think that we should push it even further because non-extractive is, is like a negative definition. 
you, you want to think that construction can actually contribute and add extra. So that's why we're so happy with clay plaster because they have a lot of positive effects on the interior air quality, the better acoustics, the better humidity and mitigating temperature, which is with the current climate change scenarios, a more and more important task for any builder and any architect. We know that the summers are gonna be hotter and the better your, your, your infrastructure is adapted to that, uh, the easier people can live uh, instead of having to rely completely on ventilation. And this is also something important that we, that, that we I, I was talking about it with the designer yesterday at Milan Design Week. It was quite funny. He said, at some point, he said, you don't know who your clients are. Sometimes it's possible that, that a very ecological designer gets in contact with a, with, a, with a client who is not ecologically minded at all, but he loves your design. He loves your, your, your style or what you make. And that's okay too. And I guess we are always a bit obsessed with, with making something very circular with earth-based materials, but you also want it to, be, it to be stylish and to be beautiful because we know that's also a bit what, what, what could be lacking maybe in the decades before us that uh, traditional building materials had a bit of a reputation of being not so hip, not so sexy. And it's really something that we, that, that we work on consistently because we know that it can have a very modern and pleasing uh, appeal to the eye. And this is uh, something that you can see also at, the, at this uh, wonderful expo is, uh, is actually like an, um, an algae plaster. It's uh, as the other plasters, it's actually mixed with algae. And you can really, where you have normal earth uh, colors like brown, red, gray, you can go towards blue and green with algae mixes. Obviously, it's also interesting because Luma Foundation, for which we did this project or this particular mix, they have an algae department. It's very interesting. But I think it's also nice that the fact that the alga actually soak up part of the CO2 is also, again, in the spirit of, of using what is present and trying to, uh, to, to really uh, diversify a bit what you do. And it's, we're, we're pretty R&D intensive because we think uh, it's, it's, it's really an urgency. Um, you have the calculations here of this paper. You could actually interpret that clay, clay plasters are CO2 negative because we cut into the transport too of uh, earth that is usually transported further away than other. But I mean, it's at some point it becomes so technical that we should not forget the architecture and the culture behind it. Uh, for us, it's an important element huh, to point out because at some point in, in construction and in building projects, uh, an LCA, a, a CO2 standard is going to become the new standard. You will have to prove which kind of uh, CO2 emission that you have in which kind of materials. For us, this is a graphic that really proves that you can build in another way and in a much cleaner way, especially if you, if you see the numbers. And maybe a question to the crowd, do you actually know how synthetic gypsum is made? There's a, a bit of a hint in the, in, the, in the picture. It's a bit ugly, but uh, it also uh, correlates with what Joseph uh, said about the um, industrial age. The industrial age has different partners and different connections, and we don't always know them. How synthetic gypsum is made, I only learned about that, I think, four or five months ago. And so what is happening? Germany's gypsum supply is threatened by coal exit. Because synthetic gypsum is made with a kind of leftover of coal factories. So that's the old industrial uh, sector or the old industrial age that used coal to connect with gypsum in one flow. And now we all know that coal is the most polluting or CO2 intensive energy source. So Germany is on the way out of coal. Finally, some would say, a German person told me yesterday too. Uh, and now they see, oh, wow, that actually has very big implications for our uh, gypsum industry. How are we going to solve that? And it's really the difficulty that you have to, in French, they say, you really have to pull out all the strings without 
uh, really dropping your economy. And that's, that's a danger that is already happening because this is what's happening in Sweden. Uh, the, um, the biggest cement producer of the country uh, has seen its permit revoked because the, the, the environmental court judged that uh, they were too polluting. And all of a sudden, this, this, this giant in Sweden is just collapsing. And it's just uh, all, all kind of uh, in construction in Sweden. So like, you cannot do this, you will cost us billions. We will lose so much jobs. And I feel bad for the people who work there, but it's really telling of how vulnerable a system is that is so polluting at the same time and still thinks, oh, but we can do anything we want. We are so good at this and this. Everybody needs cement. It's, it's, it's really a paradox that you can be so big and that concrete will probably be something that we will always use or always need in some small aspects of construction for foundations, for example, but of which we can use much less than, than we do right now because it's not well dimensioned. But then you see how, how vulnerable this industry is and it's the same thing with, with, with the gypsum that I mentioned. And so what we propose is a, is a completely different uh, material. As castar, it's much less strong than concrete, but it is 100% circular, completely reusable, complementary with floor heating. And as I mentioned, you can really take it out again and put it somewhere else in 20, 50 years if you would, if you would love to do that. So this is a bit of a special project. Uh, we were asked by Hermes to make uh, ramped earth blocks uh, based a bit on the color schemes that they had. They, they came with the, with the different uh, items and they really wanted the color scheme. And uh, for us, it was like uh, a very deadline driven, driven project, but we like a bit the challenge. So, so we were on board. And so we made based on nine tons of rammed earth about 400 modules. And I think this looks a bit like a, like a mini city. This could be Yemen if you, if you look very far. And that's, that's interesting, I think, from Hermes's point of view, that they kind of discovered that kind of uh, material and the texture that it brings. And what is pretty funny is that at some point, it's like a, it's a summer interior for the Faubourg shop in Paris. And at some point, we, we thought like, hmm, there's a, a question for a pavilion in Paris. And we might uh, be able to reuse the blocks because we know that at some point it's going to go away because the shop will have a new interior after that. And so we checked, yeah, if, if you're interested, we can use the, the blocks. And I said, no, 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 it's okay. We will uh, use it for an interior wall and it will be used in that apartment. And uh, we're very happy with it. And we said, okay, fine. That's, that's great because it's, it's exactly for that kind of reason that, that uh, ram dirt is a super material because it can just flow among clients or among people who are working with it and uh, this is maybe a bit the glamour and and this is the, the 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 first finished product and this is a bit the hard reality in brussels that we uh, when we produced the ram dirt it was snowing like hell and uh, sometimes it's a bit more difficult but yeah we have a kind of production flow and we want to be lean without uh, making it too difficult on our production workers, but we have a constant production. And sometimes we have this production for Hermes, which is like a one off where we really make something on demand because we're not say, so to say professional designers, we, we produce building materials and we think it's, it, it's good that, that there's as much impact and as much volume as possible. And so when you see the ram dirt blocks of, uh, of, uh, of Hermes, it's nice in design, but you can do a lot with it that is even structural. And so the wall is an inner wall at an architect's house. It's a 15 meter ram dirt wall. It was a lot of work. That's a bit tricky part about ram dirt is uh, with concrete, it, it magically uh, sticks itself, it's chemically binding. But here you really have to ram it so that makes it a very work intensive uh, material but i think the look is, is super interesting and for example this is a a belvedere like a watchtower in a, in a regional park in a natural park uh, that we made with ram dirt from the site so that's then the local mix we're not gonna export uh, earth from brussels to a spot if we know that spot we could actually 
use the earth from there. I think it's a bit um, part of the, of, the, of the perspective in circularity that you use what is local, what is uh, present without having to uh, uh, really extract something or uh, export something that would actually a bit defeat the idea of working with, with, with sustainable mm -hmm. material. And then you have the briquette. The briquette is our block. And we have to be honest, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we are a growing startup, but we see that the briquette is actually too expensive. In that sense, the construction market is like brutally honest. It's, uh, it's the price is a very obsessive uh, thing within the construction. It's normal. Architects have to, have to uh, justify themselves towards their clients. They have to justify themselves towards their bureau. So in that sense, price is always going to be an issue. But we have a plan of, of, of really scaling it and producing it in a better and faster way. And so we are looking at a very big project to really start uh, scaling up production. And at the same time, we think, because this is, this is a bit of a technical graphic, but we think that other CO2 intensive blocks are, become, are going to become more expensive. It's already a bit like that in the brick market. The big brick market is actually a market that is going down. It's not going up. In that sense, because the C CO2 intensity of a big brick is practically impossible to avoid. You have to burn it, you know? You cannot electrify it, it's, it's too difficult to do. So in that sense, we think that there are possibilities if we start scaling it. And this is a bit of a, a, an ambitious project that we're doing, it's called YouTube. Uh, for, for the subway tree Brussels, there's gonna be millions of tons of clay that is going to be excavated. It's seven stations. That, is that are going to be built. And what we are trying to, to do is to see how we can use the excavated earth to actually build the metro stations themselves. And it will be done with what we guess now minimally is 50% less CO2, but might be 70 or 80 and a lower price and obviously boosting local jobs because you're going to produce it at the spot. So for us, this is a bit of a project where we could finally say like, how much can you actually push in this, into this? And uh, I was in Milan yesterday. Other people are from Milan too. There are excavations going on. There's also a metro line. So it's something that you can prove within cities that it could actually work. And it's really completing the circle of, of, of construction. And I think it is, it is really something that we need because um, now the carbon prices have gone up uh, 60 euros. It's been a very long time that it was that high. It's never been that high, actually. One year ago, it was 15 euros. Now you have producers already starting to complain like, oh, we are all for a higher C2 price, but not that, that high or not that fast. But it, it has to be, I mean, it's strange, eh? but economists hardly agree on anything but they all agreed that there should be a higher price on CO2. It's something that practically every economist agrees upon because what is, is talked about in this Expo 2 is we want to avoid all the externalities. But there, if, if there is no price on the externality, you cannot, you cannot feel it. And so the market doesn't feel it. And so the people who are obsessed with the price, somewhere it's, it's justified because you don't want to uh, try to rent or, or sell overpriced houses or apartments to people who are also looking for uh, an honest way of living. I mean, at, at some point, this price is going to go up and maybe going to go towards 100 euros, maybe more. And it's important to know because it is a, a risk, for example, for the cement company in, in Sweden, uh, building materials are super exposed to uh, higher CO2 price. And why is that? Because they have high volumes. They are very dependent on fossil fuel usually or on a kind, or a kind of fossil fuel to produce. And so they are super exposed to every time the price of CO2 goes up. And we've already seen it with COVID. The logistics is complicated. If you ask an architect now with a project, like how, how is the price issue? <laughs> how is it going? he is going to start to curse because the prices that he had six months ago are already different now. So it's already kind of uh, edging into the market and that, it's, that is really uh, tricky uh, and it will have to be buffered a bit. 
and it will open uh, opportunities for practically everyone in this room, for every company in this room that has a very low CO2 intensity and that is working with, with very clean materials. In that sense, what the commission decided uh, uh, one or two years ago is really a, a game changer and has set the, the, the board straight for everyone. And I think the fact that there is also a new Bauhaus program, also cultural project, also something that Joseph said here uh, at Space Caviar, that it can not only be about technicities, about uh, specificities, about how much carbon, it also has to be about uh, a cultural concept. We don't want to make things that are super ecological, but ugly, you know, it's, it, it's that simple. Um, and that's why I, I, I like to refer also to this project because um, we are maybe obsessed with Earth. You can tell uh, we, we do practically everything with Earth, but there's also uh, a lot more than Earth. And, and that's why I, I like to pick out this project in Molenbeek, in the heart of Molenbeek. It's from uh, an architect called Hannah Ekelmans from He Architecten. And it's actually like an extension in an existing building in Molenbeek a house that was very derelict, that, that uh, was, was really neglected. And so the extension is done with wood. It's in the heart of the city. It's density. You create extra space in a space that already exists. Uh, that's already a good thing because you don't have to extend extra utilities. Spatially, it's good. And then you see the different materials that are used, like straw, which is a very good isolation material. And that is a byproduct of agriculture. It's really in the city in Molenbeek. It's not somewhere far off on a farmland, but it's the, the straw could be uh, used very close by. And you have this combination with agriculture, which I think is really interesting and that you also see in different projects here. And then inside you have the clay plasters of BC as a finish on the existing walls, plus on the straw isolation. We also have the wood obviously for, for, the, for the different uh, floors. And you have a rammed dirt counter that was made on the spot with the castar mix. And it's actually like a nice uh, element within, within the whole interior. And I think hempcrete is a bit the same. The hempcrete was also used in, in, the, in the former project then, but I wanted to show the, the Edigam picture again because it's, uh, it, it's part Venice too. Uh, it's, a, it's a good isolation. Obviously you have to do it a bit thicker than, than other isolations because it's not as uh, isolation or insulating as, 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 as PERF, for example, which is a chemical product, but it is CO2 negative. Obviously you have to still uh, use lime, kind of, yeah, uh, still a difficult uh, material in the sense that you still have to burn it, but it's also very local. I, I think about Ferrara, for example, that is not that far from here and the region where hemp was, was, was cultivated for a very long time and maybe still, I, I'm not sure. And in that sense, I think stuff like straw, like hemp, that can be cultivated within seasons and doesn't really uh, extract or it actually adds to, to, the, to the health of the soil and the salt of the earth are really good solutions. Because um, hemp, for example, for me, what, what I think is, is nice about it is that uh, instead of uh, extracting like you see with biofuels, that was the big problem. You know, you had land that was used uh, to cultivate uh, vegetables or, or plants that were solely serving for, for, for letting cars drive, you know? And it was a very uh, egregious way of land use. In that sense, hemp is much more useful in, in, in being able to plant it within seasons and not being an, an, an only uh, purpose for, for, for cars, for example, or for construction. And in that sense, I think uh, agriculture and farmers can be a very, very healthy uh, alliance for, for construction. I picked out this one because usually straw is also considered something that for particular projects, for private projects. But this is actually a, a school in, in France that is going to build completely in, in straw. And you can, you can really use it in, in, in different scales. Huh? Grammy Term, uh, our friends are there too. It's super cool that you can actually isolate with grass. And I mean, a lot of people don't know it, but these kind of materials like grass, straw, hemp, and others too, are super useful and we really should start uh, implementing them much more 
they are going to clean up the balance of a, of a, of a construction project and they will be healthy and uh, hygrometric too, which I think is from a, a bioclimatic point of view much, much better than, 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 uh, than the classic ventilation and per. So here you see really, I mean, there is no, uh, in French they say, yapa photo. It's, it's, not, it's not difficult to see what are the good materials in these kind of uh, contexts. I think the funny one is denim because you can use genes as a kind of isolation if you really stack it very well. Uh, it's, it's actually neutral in the sense that if you keep using it, it will take out some of the CO2 because it isolates. And the way that it's produced is not super uh, uh, CO2 intensive, but if it would be burnt, that's the, that's the problem with, with fashion, that a lot of clothes are actually burnt and then it's, this is a huge CO2. So denim is really in the middle of it. And cork uh, and straw bales are just really, really good, good materials. Again, you will have to see what kind of land you use in which kind of context, in which kind of uh, territory to make the mix. But there are, there are, all of these are solutions that are present in the market and that should be used. So we are also, I'm talking a bit about the other materials too, because we are in, in, in earth business, you could say, but we are also thinking a bit about working more intensively with, with other partners, because we know that for an architect or for any builder, uh, his house will never be made in one material. It will be made in different materials. And it would be silly to say each on his own island, we are going to do this, you keep doing that, you keep doing that, without offering a bit the combined uh, the combined assets, the combined synergies of different materials. And that's why we, we, we are starting a bit to do, think about workshops with, for example, Rotor, which is uh, a very good uh, company from, from Brussels that is recuperating materials from uh, sites, building sites, and with uh, Sonian Wood Company, who is a, a company that is actually buying up the wood that is uh, that has to be chopped down, like the over uh, the over uh, production of the Sonian wood, and it's really telling what what used to happen with that wood. In in it's one of the biggest forests in in Belgium. It's next to Brussels and, and a bit part of Brussels, and almost eighty percent of the wood was uh, transported to Asia, and was turned into toothpicks. So we have this kind of system where you transport or export the wood that you have and you import other wood and it's really i don't think we can go on with with the system as it is i mean it's it's, it's just it's not productive for ecological but also not for economical reasons and in that sense we think like the combination with earth wood is very good because they actually kind of eliminate each other's deficiencies secondhand materials are super good too, because in some cases, uh, for example, like a clay plaster, you cannot use it in a bathroom. You cannot use it as a, as a, as a, as a shower uh, back, back wall, uh, but you could use it perfectly. I mean, that kind of combinations where you make the structure as in the Project Karpers in, in Molenbeek, where the top structure is in wood, where you use the clay plaster as an interior finishing, where you use second hand for certain harder materials. It's really, I think, in quality of life and in, in, in carbon balance and in externalities, it's great. It's a great combination. And it's a bit what, yeah, what I would like to conclude is that, that you really have a lot of options. There are a lot of possibilities. Maybe it's not going as fast enough as we think. It's a bit why we do a lot of workshops. We, we, we invite architects uh, or our architects are really knocking on our door to do workshops practical, theoretical. Sometimes it's a workshop where we just like here, give a bit the basic introduction into earth building with some theory mixed with practice. But we also do really super proactive workshops where we just say, we are going to do uh, a stool today in rammed earth. And at the end of the day, it's gonna be finished. And it's really uh, more practice than theory. Because we think in that way, you can really connect with people and you can really show how the materials work. 
and it's a bit the luxury of earth that it's it's so lovely to work with it doesn't leave any kind of toxins any kind of vocs it's really uh very tactile and that's also why we always when we when we when, when you go to talk to people that we always have the samples because it's really something that you have to touch it's it, it, it's quite incomparable with other things in that sense and eventually i think what a lot of companies that are here at the expo uh, also feel is that there are so many wins in this kind of uh, approach where you kind of strengthen cities to not be only consumers of far away imported materials but that cities can also be productive can also work towards their own climate change plans because because buildings are a very big part of uh, the co2 emissions in every city is below and if you use local earths already instead of just transporting it far away you will have a, a better and healthier interior uh, quality you will have uh, more uh, local jobs because you're working with the local material instead of something that is kind of outsourced and there's a lot of partnerships so there are so many pluses and in that sense I'm really encouraged by, by what we see here at the, at, at, at the non-extractive architecture expo that there is so much going on and that we really should start implementing and spreading the word and that way we can really have a chance of, of, of having a, a decent plan to live on for us and, and the next generations afterwards. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, Anton. That was fantastic. Um, I think it, your work um, with BC Materials is so in line with the sort of practice and the ideas that we're trying to cultivate and uh, collect here as part of this exhibition. Um, I just want to say to anyone watching online that um, there's a Q&A tab and you're welcome to raise your hand or type in a question into the Q&A tab um, and we'll answer any questions you might have. And But we can open it up to the residents and to the audience now. Okay, I have a question. Um, looking at your presentation, it seems that the process of going into a construction site and asking to take the earth that they're going to be thrown away, it's like a very simple process of, okay, the earth is there. But, but I'm curious to know, because depending on the law, depending on how they deal with the, 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 the trash, I guess that it adds so many layers of complications for you to yeah. be able to actually use such a simple material uh, for a good uh, intention, let's say. Yeah. So I'm curious, you know, what was the, the process that you went through in order to get permission yeah. to... <laughs> to be able to use such a material that is going to go to it? It's a very good question. It's probably also an Italian question because apparently in, uh, in Italian law, uh, the moment that you kind of uh, refuse property of a kind of material, it becomes waste and you cannot uh, reintegrate it or resell it anymore. And it's, it's not that different from what happens in Belgium. We had a bit of luxury that we asked the local environment agency, Bruxelles Environnement, for an exemption. So we showed what kind of tests that we do on the earth before we transform it into building materials. We showed that we work with laboratories, that we work with certified excavators, because we, that's also a luxury, we don't have to go look for the earth itself. The excavators actually bring it to us, because for them it's much shorter than having to drive it all the way to Wallonia or to Flanders. And so at some point they said, okay, this makes sense. Also from a circular point of view, you have done the tests. We know that you have done, you work professionally with the materials as architects. And so in that sense, we could prove that we were worth the exemption. Mm -hmm. But I think in the future, it's going to be a lot easier. I know uh, people in Palermo also told me about about it that it's very difficult to, to get the exemption but i think it's going to be the new logical or obvious thing to do obviously every time you use a kind of material you will have to prove that you can test it that it that it's uh, decent enough to to reuse it but it's i think it's going to be the new logic because there is a european directive coming that is putting the standard of reuse a lot higher 
they're going to ask that you use reuse 75 percent of the earth uh, that is excavated so now i mean it's usually down cycled huh? a lot of waste uh, is still down cycled you could say it with the denim pants too uh, i think we all know it uh, if you go to the container park practically mm -hmm. everything is down cycled mm -hmm. so in that sense I, I really hope that the the new logic is going to be uh, not the exemption, but the fact that it's going to be common or, or, or obvious to reuse what is uh, what is considered waste. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any question? In... Thank you. Um, I also have a question that maybe it's an Italian question. Uh, since uh, are you using also like uh, earth as a structural uh, element? Yeah. So um, how how is it uh, in terms of regulation for um, to be allowed to use it as structural? Because I know that here, if you're not using concrete or something, uh, it's really difficult to explain that you're being dirt. Uh... So um, how it's working in Belgium and how you deal with well especially for ram dirt and ram dirt you can use it in a structural way mm. we'll usually work with an engineer a stability engineer and we'll make a prototype based on the ram dirt mix if it's local or if we already know the mix like our mix uh, of castar of, of brussels earth but it's it's really um for us the stability it will be checked and it will be followed up but it's not that it's preemptively prohibited as I kind of hear that is it, that is the case in, in Italy and it's it's a bit strange because uh, we've seen the the, the round dirt uh, Tuscany houses mm. it's weird that you could actually build three two centuries ago like that mm. and that it's still standing and that there would be a structural problem mm. so I think the the, the strength of, of round dirt is especially in the size if you dimension it well you will never have an issue you know mm. And the, uh, the, the the mix is, is is obviously important, but it's, I mean, in Lyon, you still have the houses that are more than, more than mm -hmm. 100 years old. So it's really, uh, I know uh, it, the regulatory mm -hmm. yes. is going to be very strict and like very carré uh, if they are interpreting it as, as, mm -hmm. as uh, yeah, from out of the rules and not out of the construction. Mm -hmm. But it's really something that uh, that should be changed at some mm -hmm. point. I yeah, guess. Also because, for example, it's also now it's easier to with wood, but uh, until some years ago, uh, they were uh, uh, kind of the same as temporary structures because you're building with wood for for the law in Italy. So uh, yeah. that's why I was uh, I was asking. And uh, you said also that maybe we will need to have. Uh, to use concrete for foundation and so on. Uh, is it possible to use something different for foundation, for example, or like ram dirt or something? We're now working a bit on a on a shop, like a substructure for a floor, which is more circular, which is also clay -based. But I think if you really work from a fresh foundation, even for ram dirt, we usually propose that you that you have a kind of water resistant structure as a foundation, mm -hmm. usually concrete. In that sense, I think in some cases, it's difficult to avoid concrete. Mm -hmm. Not in all cases, but in some cases, it, it might be difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, by 2040 or 2045, either we will not build new buildings anymore, but we'll just reuse whatever is there, or concrete is going to have to be produced with a kind of either hydrogen technology or just offset with with two forests uh, mm -hmm. that are built uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be that kind of uh, belong i think because i mean it's very difficult to decarbonize that kind of uh, same mm -hmm. same with steel too it's they they still haven't get their gotten their head around it so it's really difficult mm -hmm. and um, have you ever tried to combine the ram dirt with the tadelat uh, um, I think Tadelect is a really, really great product, mm. usually for bathrooms or, or in some mm. cases, uh, pieces of the of the kitchen. But this, the strange part, and that's also why I mentioned the, the aesthetic part, is that mm. people love ram dirt for the look. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes they have to make the tough choice mm. of 
having a ram dirt and then they have to say like uh, in belgium you have to isolate in most cases you have to insulate in most cases and then you have to choose am i going to insulate from the inside mm. or from the outside mm -hmm. the inside that means i'm not going to see the ram dirt when i'm in my mm. house you know because the the insulation is is, is really all over the place uh, or am i going to do it from the outside but then my special ram dirt is not going to be, be able to be seen by anyone who passes <laughs> by so in some cases i think in, in lyon and probably in tuscany too it's just a ram dirt there's probably no insulation in it and it's just uh, it's a very good and i think the the, the temperature mitigation effect of, of a ram dirt house is so good that you can in some climates it's just perfect mm -hmm. probably in a belgian climate or the more north you go it's it's too difficult and you have to insulate extra with 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 a breeding uh, material mm -hmm. but yeah i mean um it's definitely words or 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 are interesting to think about combinations but i haven't mentioned the financial picture yet and ram dirt is very expensive in applying it because it's so work intensive mm. and in that sense people will usually not combine it with other materials because you're just it's bill after bill and in that sense some people will say like this is the finish i want and it's good like that mm -hmm. just uh one last question that uh, all the earth that you are excavating you can use or uh do you are, are you producing also waste in a uh, way like that some earth that you cannot use um let's put it like this we can get the earth that we can use that means that not all the earth that is excavated can be used mm. but all the earth that we ask for we can use and in that sense we can always even recuperate or integrate it in other and sometimes uh, at the end of the month we'll say like oh we still have a special mix with it, which but is really what what constitutes the leftovers and it can be bought at half price or something like that or we have people at the office who are doing a renovation themselves and, uh, and are, are going to use around the earth hmm. it's really in that sense uh, it's not up until the last millimeter of earth that you can reuse but it's, I think the reversibility and, and what uh, Joseph also has talked about a lot, it's, it's practically unbeatable for Earth. Mm. All the ingredients that are in it, in like a clay plaster and around dirt, you can completely reuse. And that's very, very rare construction. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. So I have a question from uh, Marco, he's one of the participants, and he's asking you um, if, do you calculate how much CO2 are wasted to ex extract the earth? Um, he's, he, if, it, or I'm not sure if he's saying, or he's asking if it should be in the same math with the final product. So uh, I, th I think I understand the question, in the sense that the excavation so the 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 the, the works of actually uh, constructing the foundation and then really picking it out and that we tap into that kind of um, stream is also a kind of uh, uh, emitting factor that's a fact but if you look at the complete scope uh, every um, carrière like uh, what's it called in, in in english every every um, a spot where, for example, uh, natural gypsum is excavated in mines, quarries, that's what it's called. Every quarry will always be more intensive in CO2 and in energy than a spot that is already close to the production site. And in that sense, our LCA, which is a bit the next big thing as an indicator for, for building materials, will always be better than something that is uh really mined or dug up or quarried far away and in, in that sense it will always ask more energy to take it from there than to take it from a local spot where we already started transforming it mm -hmm. you have like these four stages in in, uh, in in an lca it's like the extraction the transport to production and then the deposition and in all of these factors uh, raw earth is super good material because uh, it hardly presses on anything uh, of those uh, uh, stages 
and yeah, that's been the reason why we like it that much, I think, because we know that it's a very clean way and, and a non extractive way of work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Many thanks for the presentation. Uh, um, maybe it, it turned out that all is, is better than um, new. Uh, such approach it could, could be um, 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 re realized on side, uh, joined with the tunnel companies. Um, if I understand the question well, you you are talking so, uh, about uh, as, as a modular approach of in in the industrial yeah. spoke uh, um, industrial more than ab, ab industrial approach. Could you could you repeat once more? I haven't understood. No, no, no. The, 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 the question, the, the, the question about uh, the modularity of yeah. uh, industrial approach uh, is possible to think. A embedded technology with the tunneling uh, companies, tunneling, tunneling, tunneling companies, um, what is the, uh, companies of uh, um, perforating uh, tunneling companies. Uh, oh yeah, 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 tunneling companies. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's a good combination as long as a bit what Marco said too. If you know that the excavation works are some kind of necessity and that they're not too intrusive in any kind of neighborhood or kind of environment, I think it's a good combination and it could be perfectly combined. And it's actually that way that tunnels and even the earliest tunnels were made, they were really uh, taking the earth and directly breaking it. For example, some of the tunnels in the have been made like, like that for the earth directly transformed into big bricks uh, as fast as possible we break all their way through the tunnel so in that sense uh, it's, it's a logical solution obviously um, um, from building technical it will have to be workable uh, for stability for humidity for whatever purpose the material would serve but um, what we do is already starting to push people to rethink what kind of materials they have, and how can you read? But the quantities are so enormous. I mean, we saw this year a maximum of, of 346 tons of, of, uh, of, of different uh, things like compressor blocks, uh, ram dirt, and clay plasters. But there's two million tons every year that is excavated in, in Brussels. So in that sense, there is a, a giant flux of materials that we could really use. I think we could use about half of it. Uh, but it's, I mean, the, the 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 offer of the ingredients is usually not a problem. We really have to start working on the output. And in that sense, gramiterm is still a bit more expensive than 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 per for per plates uh, for isolation. And in that sense, that's what I meant with, with the market too. The market really has to start to reflect the externalities. Otherwise, it will be very difficult for any startup, any kind of uh, company that, that has low carbon materials to gain its weight on the market because uh, the price is so um, dominating in, in, these kind of, uh, in these kind of systems. But it's a good suggestion. Huh? You can you can really use it a lot in, in different contexts. For example, like the tunneling companies. Any more questions? Do we have any more questions from the participants or here? So if not, we could um, finish our uh, lecture and. Thank you, Anton, once again for coming to Venice. And Thank you for inviting me. Being here with us. Uh, and please continue following us on our next events. You can find us on Instagram and also on the Non Extractive Architecture blog and website. And until next time. Thank you.